you a kid who said, I'm going to be in politics one day? I still have the shoes that I walked door to door in my first campaign. Oh, baby. Flip them around. This is about the freedom of a country and the destiny of millions of people. What do you think is going to happen in Cuba? The truth is we don't know. Who's the most talented political figure you've met so far? When I hear a Bill Clinton or I hear a Pete Buttigieg, he tugs you a little bit in their direction. Was Donald Trump a good president? I think a leader should be inspired. I don't think he should be someone who puts people down. That's really bad reporting. Would you run for president? Uh... <laughs> Hey, bienvenidos. Welcome to the show. I'm Carlos Watson. Today's a special one. We're going to my hometown. The mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez. Now, you've seen him on TV. You've seen him on social media. He's become quite the sensation. Some would say he's the hottest mayor in the country right now, and he may be thinking about running for president. You don't want to miss this conversation. Hey, mayor. Good to see you. Hey, my man, what's going on? Looking good. Hey, oh, man, you look good. You look comfortable. That's 50% of the battle right there. You still working out every morning? Oh, yeah. Come on now. Now, what do you do? I don't know if we even talked about it. I basically do CrossFit. Now, what about basketball? Did you ever play any ball? Yeah, man, you know, I was a high school baller. So I was in high school with Udonis Haslam, you know, Stevie Blake, who played for the Lakers for a while. And uh, so a couple guys that played in Europe. Now, did you think about playing ball in college or no? I got recruited and I, I literally, this is exactly the day that my basketball career ended. It was my the first practice in college. And I realized, man, I'm going as hard as I can. And these guys are like not breaking a sweat. And I just said, you know what? This is God's way of telling me that this is the last day of, of my basketball, <laughs> my basketball career. That was it. The unvaccinated still driving exploding cases in the country's new epicenter of Florida, where hospitals are building new wards to cope with the record crush of patients. COVID, heartbreaking what seems to be happening in Florida. Is there something different that the governor or you or other leaders should be doing to try and get things under control? Yeah, look, you know, we've been breaking records and they're not kind of good kind of records, right? I think Florida's broken the record for most uh, cases. I have a, a friend from high school who's in the ICU and un was unvaccinated. And it's also become increasingly a pandemic among the unvaccinated. You know, 90 to 95% of people that are hospitalized are not vaccinated. And 99% of the people that are vaccinated do not experience serious complications. And if the governor were to call me and ask me for advice, I would say, look, go back to the way you were handling this at the beginning. At the beginning, he allowed local governments to make decisions. He empowered them, and then he supported them. The recommendation that I would give to people is go talk to your local doctor, the person who you talk to pre-COVID and you're going to talk to post-COVID. Because those are the people that are not political. They have no dog in the fight. They just want you to be healthy. I don't know if I've ever asked you about uh, you getting into politics. Did you always feel like it was a given? Were you a kid who said, I'm going to be in politics one day? Not really. I mean, I did get a, involved in a little bit of student government, but it wasn't like, oh, this is my lifelong goal. I want to be president of the United States or anything like that. I'm not one of those guys. And I saw my dad, who I think the world of. I mean, my dad came to this country at 12, didn't speak English, got a full scholarship to Harvard. And I just saw him get beat up on stuff. And I just thought, you know, I don't know that I like a system that is so unfair to people who are sacrificing so much. And I got older and, you know, I did the things that people do. I bought a house, I got married, and I realized, you know, I had two options. I could complain about things, right? Like, hey, these are things that I don't like, or I could be part of the solution. And I was fortunate enough to run. I ran a very hard, long race. I was very young, I was 30, and I won by 262 votes. So very, very close election. I tell people all the time, if 131 people would have changed their mind, we wouldn't be having this conversation. When you think about the fact that you won by 262, are there any lessons for you about this is what you do in order to win those close ones rather than lose? Or do you just say, you know, it was what it was? I think when I won by 262 votes, I was very humble. You know, I was like, man, I just got here. I want to sort of stay quiet, not ruffle any feathers until I have to do something that I feel very compelled to do. And then it, it led to my popularity that allowed me to be elected by 85%. In the city of Miami, Francis Suarez will follow in his dad's footsteps. He won the race for mayor in a runaway. As we embark on this new era for the city of Miami, we must be ready to meet the challenges of the future. That humility that comes with a close race could really propel you. And by the way, you can never forget it. I still have the shoes that I walked door to door in my first campaign over 12,000 doors. Yo, Miami and Florida has been famous for walkers. Oh, baby. Oh, flip them around. Okay, uh, have you changed your mind about any important topics 
as mayor? I think I've evolved in a lot of uh, different areas. You know, I'm Catholic, yeah. but, you know, I've been pro-LGBTQ, you know, as a Republican. You know, it's sort of anti-narrative, right, uh, to be pro-environment. This plan primarily focuses on our short-term interim target of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 60%. You know, in immigration, there's a presumption that if you're Republican, you're not in favor of immigration. And I come from an immigrant family. My mom came when she was six, my dad when he was 12. So I think that those are three big issues where, you know, my growth has led me to a significant amount of evolution. And I suspect that there'll be many more in the future. The crypto elite all in your city, you've almost tried to rebrand the city uh, around crypto. We want to be a city that focuses on the next a uh, series of technological advances. Talk to me about crypto, because obviously you've been in the news a lot embracing crypto. What made you interested in it? And what made you bring it into the political sphere? I think the measure of a good politician is being able to take the complicated and distill it to make it simple and understandable for people, for everyday people, and to understand why it affects them. And so for me, I think crypto is a great example of my ability to be able to do that. Crypto is no different than when you open your computer and you check your bank account. You have a digital representation, in that case in dollars, of what you own, right? In the case of Bitcoin, this is a digital currency, much like what your digital representation is on your laptop, except that a community of people have decided to assign that value. We believe the dollar has value because it was issued by the US government. So the same thing has happened with Bitcoin. What makes Bitcoin interesting and different is that it is not run by a particular government. It's not run by a particular person. It's run by a community of people that are exchanging it and the market has created a value for it. So today you can go on any exchange anywhere instantly and get for one Bitcoin, approximately 45,000 US dollars. So it has a tremendous amount of value. So what does it mean that you're embracing Bitcoin as mayor of Miami? It means that everyone is going to be able to participate in ways they can't participate now. When a building is built, it's built with two things, debt, which comes from a bank, and equity, which comes from investors, right? They put in equity. Unless you're a multi, multi-millionaire and own shares in a bank, or you're a multi, multi-millionaire and are putting money in as the equity, you cannot benefit from the upside of that. And so what's gonna happen is as you tokenize Right, you create a digital representation of a share of that building, whether it's the debt part or the equity. In the future, you're gonna be able to say, I wanna put $100 in the equity of this 80 story building. And you're gonna be able to get 20% returns, just like the guy that's putting $20 million into it. It's gonna unlock a tremendous amount of investment opportunities for everyday people that right now have all their money in banks and are not getting anything in return. How much do you and your dad talk about politics? My dad's like one of my best friends, if not my best friend. We're very close. Um, my dad is much more of a political animal right. than I am in the sense that I think he's run the last time I counted like 15 times. <laughs> he's an interesting guy. He's very intense yeah. uh, in a good way. So sometimes I wish we could talk about basketball a little bit more, or talk about some, some other things uh, other than politics. What would he give me as his biggest takeaway? Because you know that back when I was young, I was an intern uh, for him. And there was a moment I remember where people talked about him maybe running for governor, for Senate. Does he ever look back on that and say, hey, son, here's what I would have done differently or here's the biggest lesson I take from my journey? What he didn't have was the ability to, to have potentially a national profile because of things like social media, uh, which I've, many would argue that I've successfully leveraged, right? So I think that's something that, you know, he would talk about. Who's the most talented political figure you've met so far? People like, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy, people like uh, Reagan, um, Bill Clinton, uh, certainly Obama. And then you have people like Marco Rubio and Crenshaw on the Republican side. I like Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg is a former mayor uh, who I think is extremely dynamic, extremely intelligent. I look to people who articulate their side of the aisle in the best way so that even if like I'm a Republican, right? But when I hear a Bill Clinton or I hear a Pete Buttigieg, I think to myself, man, that guy's really smart. He really knows what he's saying. He tugs you a little bit in their direction. And so I think that's what real political talent is. And that's what oftentimes we're missing in a modern day world that I think people are thirsty for. Who's not a politician, but should play politics? I would say actors have a great opportunity. Obviously, you know, you have somebody like a Donald Trump who was a celebrity or whatever. You're fired, you're fired, you're fired. That Ronald Reagan, who was an actor, you know, when you're an actor, part of delivering a message is understanding how your audience receives the message. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. And I think what, what's amazing about actors is they're not just 
acting a part, they're conscientious of how is it being received. And that's why I think they're often very good communicators and communication is an enormously important part of being in politics. Why did you end up being a Republican? You know, I grew up, like I said, Catholic. I grew up sort of a conservative in the sense that government should be as small as possible, right? It should try to do its core competencies and then sort of let the private sector dictate everything on a day-to-day -day basis. I believe in national defense. I believe in a party of, you know, balanced budgets, which frankly, neither of the two parties have really done. I would like you to come back with a 5% uh, cut. Get rid of the fat. Was Donald Trump a good president? I think Donald Trump did some good things. I think his stance on China uh, was very good. As you know, China tried to say that it was caused by American soldiers. That can't happen, not as long as I'm president. I think moving uh, the embassy to uh, Jerusalem was a very good decision. I personally like a lot of his Supreme Court justice uh, nominations. I think there's been some missed opportunities on climate. And then, of course, the personality stuff, it just doesn't resonate with me. That's really bad reporting. And you want to get back to reporting instead of sensationalism. I think a leader should be inspiring. I don't think it should be someone who puts people down. I think it should be someone who builds people up. Would you run for president? I'll say this. The mayoral position, because of COVID, because of the 24-hour news cycle, because of social media, it's been elevated. And people know national mayors a lot more than they did, you know, a generation ago. And so I think it becomes more possible. Do you feel like you're ready to run for president? I'll be honest with you, I actually think the American people would want to see someone that's a next generation candidate, whether it's me or someone else. I really do think people are, are thirsting for that. Why do you think that Florida is becoming such a hotbed for presidential contenders? Well, I think Florida is a microcosm of the country. It's the third largest electoral votes. And so as Florida goes, oftentimes the nation goes. If you were to go back, talk to your younger self, 18, 19, what do you think would surprise him the most? At 18, 17, I was probably interested in girls and basketball and not much else, you know. <laughs> he would be um, impressed that I sort of pivoted at some point in my life to more serious endeavors. I think from a family perspective, hopefully he'd be proud of the family man that I am, you know, in terms of having a wife and two beautiful children. Anything about how life works that would surprise him? I think what would surprise him is that nothing is given to you. You know, my 18 year old self, would be shocked to know how hard you have to work to get ahead and be successful. The whole international community is seeing the level of desperation and the failure of the communist uh, government in Cuba and its uh, inability to protect and, and feed its people and, and give them the basics. What do you think is gonna happen in Cuba? None of us know for sure. Well, Carlos, I think you said the wisest thing because it takes a lot of humility to say it, which is nobody knows for sure. Because irrespective of the way people talk about the issue, as if they know, like, hey, oh, if, if we only did this, it would happen. Or if we only did that, it would happen. The truth is we don't know. If the end goal is liberating the Cuban people, then there may be steps that have to be taken that the American people right now don't want to take, right? Like if saying we're willing to do X, Y, and Z, but no more because we don't want to intervene. We don't want to be seen as interventionists. And I don't think politicians want to say that. You know, they, they're kind of dancing around all these issues. I just wish the conversation was a little bit more honest. It's not a Republican or Democratic thing. This is about a human rights issue. This is about the freedom of a country and the destiny of millions of people who don't have what we have. Is the reasonable expectation, you think, is that Cuba's no longer going to be the hot button issue 10 years from now, that that generation will no longer be as central to uh, political conversation in Miami and in Florida. I don't think I could say that and I'll tell you why. In my dad's generation and my grandfather's generation, which frankly has passed, they're at an age where they don't have the physical strength and the energy to be part of this discussion. What's interesting about it is that there has been a new generation that has picked up the baton, if you will, and there are two segments. One of them is the in Cuba Cubans who were born in the revolution, who are basically born in a communist ideology and they realize we have enough internet to know that the world is a lot better outside and the other one is the new arrival cubans who are not part of that exile generation by the way 75 percent of them voted for donald trump that's just a fact and those new arrival cubans are extremely pro-intervention because they understand that if we don't do something nothing's going to happen i want to do a little bit of rapid fire with you if i can of course uh your best celebrity moment of all time I think one of the coolest ones was when I gave LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh the keys to the city when they kind of came together, right? The big three, when they had that big event in the American Airlines Arena at the time. Not two, not three, not four, 
Not five. The most interesting athlete in Miami today. I think it's Udonis Haslam. Udi's a, a childhood friend. Um, your favorite book of all time. Hey, it's a volume set, which is written by Winston Churchill, the history of the English speaking people. It reminds me of a good quote that he gave where he said, history will, will be kind to me because I intend to write it. Oh, your favorite TV series. I thought Billions was really good. What we do has consequences. Come to work every day and be just and strong in the actions you bring and don't waver. If I gave you one do-over, what would you use it on? I probably would have been a Navy SEAL. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I'm not a gun guy. I just think that they are warriors and they're able to push themselves. Hey, listen, thank you for giving me so much time. You got it, brother. See you soon. Take care. Liz, come on down, what'd you think? He's not a Trump Republican. He has that logical thinking that we don't see with a lot of the Trump Republicans who spin their own narrative. I feel like he's somebody who thinks for themselves. Hector. He looks really young. He's like early 40s, mid 30s. Yeah, yeah, early 40s. He uh, he does look young. So I think maybe that helps him. Kind of like what Obama, right? They saw a young uh, phase and they, they want that change. So I think that's something that helps him a lot. Eli, you want to get in there? I love mayors, and I could see him running for office, and I could see him doing well. I actually love what he had to say about immigration. Let's go ahead and get them in. We need people to work these jobs. We need people to pay their taxes. It still blows my mind how you can be like extra conservative and be of an immigrant family, you know, after the past five years of Republican politics. But I enjoyed the conversation. So I say let's get some more mayors on here. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Mayor Suarez. I think he's right that Mayor Pete has opened the door for more mayors to run for president. And guess what? I certainly think that Mayor Suarez is going to run. We'll be interesting to see if he's ready. All right, that's going to do it for us here today. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you are, remember, we've got a good new episode every weekday. Give it a try. Thank you for giving us some of your time right here on The Carlos Watson Show. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.